ahead. Good evening. This meeting is being held pursuant to Executive Order N2920, uh, issued by California Governor Gavin Newsom on March 12, 2020. Any or all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend at the Fairfield Sassoon Central Office, 2490 Hillborn Road, Fairfield, California, to observe and provide public comment during the meeting. Board members will state their name when they make the motion and when they make the second. All votes will be recorded via roll call format. If uh, my connection fails, Board Vice President John Silva will run the meeting. May I have the roll call, please? John Gott. Judy Honeychurch. Here. David Ison. Here. Jonathan Richardson. Here. John Silva. Here. Bethany Smith. Here. Craig Wilson. Here. Thank you. May I have a motion for approval of the agenda? Move approval. Second, John Gott. Okay, and John was, did you first? That was Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan, sorry, Jonathan. Okay, uh, roll call, please. John Gott. Here. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Sorry. We will be adjourning to closed session for discussion and possible action on matters of student discipline, personnel, negotiations, and litigation. Is there any public comment on closed session? Seeing, seeing no one, we will adjourn to closed session.
Sounds good to me as well, Martha. I think the issue is my computer because I'm trying to use the com like one screen and the other screen. Chris, is, Chris Clark, is that possible or do I need to change and just use one computer? So we're getting feedback now, Sheila. I know it's my setup, so I'm not quite sure how to fix it. Are you able to mute your microphone on one of your computers that you're using? Or is she logged in twice? Yeah, Sheila, what does your setup look like right now? I have my laptop in, in the office because I need that for the camera. And then I have my double screens on my, de on my desk. And do you have sound turned on on both of them? I didn't think so, <laughs> but apparently I do. Yeah, because what I'm thinking is, is that one of them has a microphone and two of them have sound. So my computer, when it, it's got to come from my computer for me. Now can you so, hear me? Yeah, yeah, you sound the same, Sheila. So I have the same setup, but my earphones and volume is, I'm plugged into my laptop, not my computer, and everything on my computer is silenced. Yeah. Right, but so my one of them laptop you just is my computer. Like I have a docking station. But you're talking through your phone, right? No, I'm actually talking through, um, turn my phone on. Oh, the I have earplugs in that I'm talking through. And what are they plugged into? My laptop. Hmm. Yeah, and, and your laptop's on your docking station, right? Correct. Here, I'll come upstairs. You're upstairs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, I'll come up and see you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Hey, Martha, I'm set up the same way. Are you guys getting feedback from me when I speak? Nope, you're no, good. you're good. Okay. Thank okay. you. My gosh, I did a mic check with Chris earlier, so thanks. <laughs> thanks for checking, Angie. I'm just. I tried to I tried check, to and check. I sounded perfect when it was just me. <laughs> Now you've got me paranoid. You sound fine too. Don't worry. Yeah, Melissa, is that you? You sound fine. Okay, test, Ruben. Test, test. From here. Test, test. It's coming from Melissa's computer right now because she doesn't have her headset. But I'm thinking once she has her headset on, it should be fine. In here. Test, test, one, two, three. Test, test. Test, test, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three. I hear it here. Test, test, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three.
Good evening. This meeting is being held pursuant to Executive Order N2920, issued by California. Excuse me, the proverbial is so annoying. Sorry. Issued by California Gov Governor Gavin Newsom on March 12, 2020. Any or all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend at the Fairfield Student Central Office, 2490 Hillborn Road, Fairfield, California, to observe and provide public comment during the meeting. Board members will state their name when they make the motion and when they make the second. All votes will be recorded in the roll call vote uh, format. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Superintendent Corey, could we please have a report of action taken in closed session? Yes, thank you, President Honeychurch. In the matter of conference with labor negotiators, no action was taken. In the matter of public employment, it is my honor to announce that by unanimous vote, the board has officially appointed Ashley March as child nutrition manager effective immediately. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Ashley. Ms. Ashley Marth, Marsh was recommended as child nutrition manager and will create state will ensure state, federal, and district compliance with nutritional service mandates. The specific responsibilities will include supporting the free and reduced meal application program, coordinating inventory and the delivery of supplies from the warehouse to school sites, and conducting employee orientations, training programs, and safety meetings. Ms. Marsh joins us from Elk Grove Unified School District, where she has served in various capacities within their Food and Nutrition Service Department since 2011. In her most recent assignment, Ms. Marsh served as a child nutrition lead. As the child nutrition lead, she has extensive exper experience with implementing regulations to ensure proper food safety and sanitation sanitation, facilitating the ordering and providing reimbursable meals for school districts, and coordinating meal delivery routes for warehouse employees. Ms. Marsh earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Health Science with a concentration in Community Health Education from CSU Sacramento, and she graduated with honors. On behalf of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District, we're very excited to have Ms. Ashley Marsh join us as our child nutrition manager. Welcome, Ashley. No other action was taken in closed session. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. I have a brief uh, opening. In light of everything happening in our nation, we are so grateful for the partnership we have with the community organization. To push through this COVID-19 pandemic, we must support one another and work together and not against each other. Mike, Mike. Moving on to four, communication recognition of the Educational Services Department by Tim Gorey. I'll turn it over. Thank you, um, Governing Board. Thank you, uh, President Honeychurch. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, recognize the Educational Services Department for their amazing work, especially during this time of COVID-19. And so uh, I'd like to read a proclamation of appreciation. That proclamation says, whereas the governing board of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District strives to maintain safe, welcoming and supportive learning environments and the board appreciates the outstanding efforts of the Educational Services Department for their creativeness, hard work, and great diligence during school closures associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the board values the work of the Educational Services Department, which included creating a distance learning plan, 
an end of year procedures guide for schools, the virtual academy K-8 school, that was no small thing, an entire school they created, an expanded summer program, a phased reopening of school plan, and a new parent newsletter all during this time. And whereas the board acknowledges the educational services department for working with various government agencies and throughout our school district to provide social emotional support, support for students with IEPs and English language learning services, and grant funds to support families in need through the Family Resource Center. And whereas the board is grateful that the Educational Services Department showed uncommon perseverance and skill in working together as a team, and whereas the governing board of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District desires to formally acknowledge the Educational Services Department for its excellent support of our students, staff, schools, and community. Now, therefore, our governing board does hereby proclaim the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District Governing Board's sincere and honest gratitude to the Educational Services Department. In witness thereof, proclaimed the 16th day of July 2020 in Fairfield, California. Please give it up for Educational Services. Um, at this time, we would normally, uh, let me find the right spot here. We would normally bring up the team members who are present at the board meeting, and we would do um, make sure that we introduce them and just give you an opportunity to recognize them personally, since we can't do that in this situation. Um, I would like to show you a short video in lieu of that time. Are you able to hear the sound? No, sir. All right, here we go. Let's try this. And that is the end of that presentation. Thank you, Educational Services, for all your great work. I, too, would like to just reiterate um, my thank you for the board's thank you for everyone in Educational Services for their above and beyond 24 hours seven work they have done since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started. The distance learning, the modified promotion, graduation requirements, modified uh, graduation services that they had to come up with, and then coming up creating a virtual academy. I mean, it's just incredible the amount of work that they have done in so short a time. So, thank you for your tireless work and your focus on school opening plans that will ensure students and staff safety. Thank you so much. Madam Chair. I know we're having a problem, I think, with her microphone. Yeah. Mr. Richardson, you have another microphone, right? You want to try? Maybe that will work better for her. 
we're going to do um, is we can move her to another room so she can just not use a microphone. And while you all are doing here, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but you're cutting in and out. It's it's not a clear. Uh, Try, of Try it again. Hi. Can you hear me now? We'll move on to uh, written reports. The written report. Uh, C. Solano investment report. Yeah, we can. We can hear you, President Isom or uh, previous President Isom. <laughs> um, I just wanted to just also congrat, you know, say thank you to, to Ed Services because, I mean, March thirteenth, we we, we suddenly had to do something different, and this was something that no one in this space has, has had to do, and they they really have stepped up, and so I just really wanted to also say thank you to Ed Services for, just scrambling and making things happen for our kids. It's just it's just huge. Um, thank you. Ron B. Any other comments, board members? Okay, now we will move on to C. B. B. The presentation of the reopening of schools for the 2021 school year, part three. And I'm going to turn it over to our superintendent. Thank you, President Highchurch. We do have some public speakers. And so that I can um, present without wearing my mask, I'm going to move into another room while we have our public speakers speak. So first we have Mr. Jim Bastian, followed by Edward Blaylock, Mike Bloom. Carl, so uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to probably butcher your name, Squirtino, and Kim Abode. So if um, we're going to have you do your public speaking. Yep. And so if you will, we'll get you set up. And I'm going to move to another room. Sheila, could you um stop presenting for the moment being? Yeah, it's still loading in. Okay. Okay. All right. There we go. All right, folks. Uh, I, when I spoke to you a month ago, well, good evening, first of all, FSUSD board. Um, and uh, I would like to thank Reverend Isom, Ms. Gott, Mr. Wilson, Ms. Honeychurch for answering my letter I wrote the other night, first of all. And uh, public, um, thank you. Um, and uh, those in the audience. Well, when I spoke to you a month ago, uh, we talked about staying away from politics and following the science. So since then, we talked, and then we talked about uh, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, Admiral Adams. We're saying uh, we're saying physical distance, social distancing, and uh, wear a mask and hand sanitizing and washing hands. And there's you haven't heard too much from them though. Past couple of months, for some reason, 
Uh, I think they've been muzzled a little bit possibly, but uh, anyway, um, that was a month ago. At that time, we thought the virus was passed by droplets, those heavy water droplets that would uh, come out of the mouth, the faces of people and drop to within about six feet, they would drop to the ground. And that's what we were thinking. At that time, with that information, I probably would have said, uh, well, maybe we could go back into the classroom because what teachers really want is to go back with their students. That's what we're built for. That's what we're made for. We're designed for that. That's what we're trained for. Um, but knowing what we know now about aerosols, about the, the flow of air and aerosol transmission, that kind of changes things. Um, I have a 50-year-old uh, system in my classroom, a uh, ventilation system. It's pretty musty in there in the afternoon sometimes. To be in there with uh, even nine children, I'm seeing 18 kids a day. Middle school and high school people would be seeing 40 to 50 people a day if we went with uh, co smaller cohorts of one-fourth, which we were thinking about. Um, I have to say now with what's going on with aerosols and, and, and uh, the safety issue, I, I have to say I think I would recommend at this point uh, distance learning, even though that's not really what I want to do. I have to say that because safety has to come first. <clears throat> Actually, uh, I was just reading an article today in Bloomberg News. It was published at 11 a.m. this morning. This is how fast things work nowadays, right? How fast things change. Uh, it was said that 2% of COVID cases in the U.S. were under 18. That part of the CDC website had not been updated since May 29th, just to let you know how things are going with the CDC. Now, we say that 10% of the California cases are under eight, the age 18. That's what the, the, the officials are saying. In Florida, 33% of the children under 18 who were tested are tested positive. Um, so I think that goes to show you uh, that we really need to err on the side of uh, being more cautious with our staff, but more importantly, our children and their families to keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, good evening. I don't know. Yeah, okay, you can see me, sorry. Uh, my name is Ed Blaylock, uh, and I have been teaching uh, world history and English at Crystal Middle School here in the district since uh, 2014. I love my job, and I take great pride in helping my students gain the knowledge and the skills uh, that they need in order to make the world a better place. Sadly, I feel like I need to point out this evening that they cannot do that if they're dead. Uh, and right now, no level of in-person instruction can be undertaken without risking not only their lives, but the lives of school staff, parents, grandparents, and community members. If we go with the breezy assurances of Secretary DeVos that only 0.2% of students will die, that leaves 42 kids in Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District who will be killed in the interest of opening up schools. Who are those kids going to be? Will one of them be on Fairfield High's football team? Will a member of the pageantry team at Crystal, my own site, be one of them? Will it include a fifth grader at Crescent Elementary? Will their deaths be worth it? Will the district and the County Office of Public Health tell us their deaths were sad but inevitable? Even if we move that figure down by two thirds, will it be worth the deaths of 14 kids to ensure that the other kids in the district get their time face to face in the classroom? How can even one completely avoidable death or illness be an acceptable loss? The idea is monstrous on its face, frankly. The likelihood has been compared to that of being struck by lightning. Again, I feel I need to point out that when a storm is coming, we bring the kids in off the playground. My son is two and a half years old. He is obsessed with the octonauts. He loves chasing imaginary dragons around the park and his favorite toy in the whole world is a cheap red plastic dinosaur. He is the brightest, most beautiful thing in my entire world. Due to risk factors, I have an increased chance of lethal complications from COVID. When I die a lonely, lingering, and entirely preventable death, who will explain to my son that it was more important to get other kids in school than for him to get to grow up with his father? When my equally at risk colleagues die the same deaths, who will explain it to their loved ones? 
Students and teachers and school staff deserve better than this. I am prepared to sacrifice for my students as I have done in my time in this district already. I will not be made a sacrifice in the name of the economy or political expediency, and neither will I let it be done to my colleagues or my students. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Bloom. I've talked two other times to the board before. Um, and when you consider the first time, I talked about my background. The second time, I talked about medical considerations with COVID. Didn't get to as much as I wanted, but hopefully this will be more brief and more compact and more to the point. Like the previous speaker so eloquently said, there are considerations that you have to make that are life and death. There are people that I've worked with on these campuses for 13 years, over a decade. There are students I've developed relationships with who've come from incredibly harsh backgrounds, but they've learned to come to class. They've learned to do everything that they have to. I would regret not seeing their faces, but on the other hand, I would also regret seeing their faces and realizing that they were the 40th fatality, the 39th fatality, the 37th, what have you. I also have colleagues who have pulmonary issues in my department. I also have colleagues who actually called me up at 10 o'clock in the morning this morning, passionately saying they don't know what they wanted to do about this. And, and they are scared, literally scared, grown men scared about coming in and teaching because it's a life or death issue. The decision made in the next three days is a critical one. It's life and death of students and teachers. It's not just the quality of education, but it is the quality of life itself. I hope the decision is made wisely, succinctly, logically, and for the better future of Fairfield. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Carl Shortino. I am a parent um, and uh, I'm an alumni of Fairfield High School. I graduated in 2001. Um, so I can't speak to the fear that a teacher has or the, the concern that a student has, but I can speak to the reality of trying to Maintain social distancing in a classroom whose square footage cannot possibly have six foot distance between each student in a classroom that's 30 foot by 30 foot. It's not mathematically possible. I'm a, I'm a contractor by trade. I build things all the time. I'm pretty good at that kind of math. Um, I also know that the school district doesn't really have the funds because when stuff like this comes down from the state level and the federal level, they just put it on you guys to figure it out. Well, you can't pay for all of the extra janitorial time you're going to have to do to clean the classrooms and sanitize everything. Um, I have a suggestion um, that I was talking with um, one of the board members earlier, and then um, I got an email from the uh, – hold on a second, I got it here on my phone – um, from Liz Teresi, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but it's in regards to the current contract with the Fairfield PD for the SOC officers. That's a $400,000 contract that if you're going to be distance learning and virtual learning, you don't have a need for police officers at any of the campuses because no campuses are open. There's your money uh, to pay for either Chromebooks, laptops, whatever, that the students that don't have them, that need them so that they can distance learn. Um, there's also your money, if you are going to have ch children back in the classroom, to pay for the expenses of having the social distancing and the sanitation requirements. Um, I think that's something that should be considered. 
because I know you have to find the money somewhere and I don't think shutting down a, a school site location or negotiating with the teachers union to maybe cut their funding is the proper course of action. I think that all, all um, options should be on the table. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Good evening, my name is Kim and Bowden, and I am a parent of two students in the district. And first, I just want to appreciation for everything the board and the Fairfield staff, especially our teachers are doing during this unprecedented time. Uh, I know that everybody has been through a lot. Um, there's been a lot of talk on the best way to reopen. And parents have always had the option to do homeschooling. So I know you have parents out there who are saying, you know, don't open. I don't want to send my child to school. And they still, they always have had that option. So even if schools were to reopen, whether it's 100% or in these phased approaches, um, it, some things I want you to you know think about um, and that I would like answers to. I am a proponent of students returning to school, but it has to be in a safe environment. None of us wants to put our students or the teachers at risk, so we have to be safe about this. Um, that you just had on your agenda table the American um, Medical Association article that talked about the you know, advantages to having students in the classroom. I think the social and mental and, you know, we all know about those. If you do um, distance learning, so as a parent, I just want to bring up some things that we experienced in the spring. And I realized that was kind of a last minute thrown together and you guys, you know, did the best you could. But some things are just out of your control. For instance, we live in Cordelia. Our internet was down for three and a half hours this morning. How, how do you plan to work through those kind of technology, you know, technology challenges? If students are in the spring, you know, they could do their schoolwork at different times during the day. So getting on the internet, if it didn't work, you get on it later. But if students are gonna be expected to be on a class from 9 a.m. to 10, that, you know, Comcast is gonna be overwhelmed. Internet is not free. So how are you addressing the parents who don't have access to internet? Um, kids who are, too old to be in daycare, but kind of too young to be by themselves. Parents have to work. So I'm just wondering, how, you know, what are some of the thoughts going into that, the distance learning and how will there be supervision and ensuring that the students are doing the work? I know I have a family, you know, a child who needed me there. And so I had to take a leave, you know, some time off from work to do that. I can't do that all next year. And so families are gonna have to make, you know, hard choices. How will you determine which students come to school and which students not? And then because I'm almost out of time, I just wanna mention the inconsistencies that you currently have. For instance, football is allowed to be conditioning, but band isn't. I understand playing an instrument might not be safe, but there's ways band could be doing their conditioning safe, social distancing, they're not allowed to do, but football is out doing theirs. So I would like you know some of those things addressed so that we have consistencies. Um, and since I'm out of time, thank you for listening. Thank you. Do we have another speaker? I believe that was our final speaker. Okay, thank you. So I'll turn it over to you, um, Superintendent Corey. Okay, and I'm gonna just uh, Dr. McCabe, bring up our presentation at this time. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. As I have mentioned numerous times, the topic of reopening school has been on everyone's mind since campuses were closed on March 13th. Since that time, hours each day have been dedicated to the topic of reopening. How can we do this safely? What is our best option? What are other districts doing? What do our parents want? What about our staff members? What are their thoughts? Well, at our last meeting, I think somebody needs to mute, by the way, before I go on. I believe that might be Sheila. Okay, thank you. Um, at our last board meeting, just 28 days ago, 
staff presented our plan for reopening at schools. At that time, Solano County was reopening, and we felt strongly that if museums, entertainment centers, bars, restaurants, nail salons, et cetera, could reopen, then we needed to find a safe way to reopen our schools. If you recall, we had to adjust our presentation that evening because we initially thought that masks would be highly recommended, um, but that day, our governor put out a requirement that masks were required throughout California. Unfortunately, over the past 28 days, the number of positive COVID cases have increased significantly, include, um, as well as the number of hospitalizations. Here's how fast quickly and quickly things change. We posted our board agenda on Friday, and then things changed this past Monday. Governor Newsom ordered the immediate shutdown of museums, galleries, zoos, aquariums, family entertainment centers, movie theaters, restaurants, bars, nail salons, et cetera. The following day, staff convened a meeting with our union leaders to discuss a different plan for reopening schools. And we also scheduled a special governing board meeting to take action on an alternative plan. What I can tell you is no matter what we decide, it's a lose-lose situation. There is no way that we are gonna please everyone as the, op as the opinions and the beliefs surrounding this issue are varied and they are often opposing. Our presentation tonight may end up being an exercise in futility as Governor Newsom is scheduled to make an announcement tomorrow regarding the reopening of schools in California. And that will happen at noon. Nonetheless, we have a presentation for you. It might be a little bit lengthy, but we believe that this is um, important information for our board members to hear prior to the special board meeting on Monday when you will take action on this issue. Could you please go to slide two? Our purpose in this district, of course, is academic achievement. But our goal for reopening school is to deliver the most effective instruction possible and also protect the health of our students and staff. I'm now gonna turn this over to Tim Gorey. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. Um, throughout our journey with COVID-19, we've asked for input from our stakeholders. And that input over time has helped us, uh, help guide us to the place that we are right now in our thinking. We've received input from the families that we serve, uh, from the staff who serve them, the associations that represent our staff, you, the governing board, and the larger Fairfield Sassoon community. We've received this input through meetings in person, uh, meetings of all types, including uh, Google Meets, from surveys, emails, and social media channels. We've also received guidance from many government agencies in the forms of both recommendations and requirements. Sorting through um, what is required, for whom, at which time, and in which situation, and separating those requirements from the many recommendations um, that may also apply to us has been incredibly challenging. These recommendations and requirements come mainly from the realms of health, such as the CDC, the California Department of Public Health, and the Solano County Public Health Department, as well as education departments at the federal, state, and county levels. But we've also had to pay close attention to advice from safety organizations such as OSHA and executive orders straight from the governor. Much like the individual sectors of our community, these guiding agencies don't always agree with each other. So we take them as inputs and we do our best to find the best way forward. As you all know, no matter which situation or which phase we are in, the safety and the security is of utmost importance to all of us in Fairfield Sassoon and throughout our community. These past months, we've been adding additional safety measures in our organization. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Ken Whittemore, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, to share some of these efforts.
Mr. Whittemore, you're muted, so you're going to have to start over. There you go. There <laughs> we go. Hit the wrong button. Um, good evening, and thank you, Superintendent Corey. Uh, we as a district are in the process of adding additional human resources to address uh, to address uh, and assist uh, assisting in the needs of our students during this pandemic time. Uh, we have posted or in the process of hiring uh, eight LVNs. Those have been posted in the last three weeks, and we continue to monitor them day and, and have them in for interviews. Uh, we have hired, we are hiding nine, nine additional custodians, and that includes taking two part-time employees and making them full-time, and then adding eight additional custodians for that cleaning and the things that need to take place at our schools and, and prepare them for when students arrive. We've been hiring additional teachers. We work with our um, with our ed services department and looking at needs where we have overages and where we have high class sizes, and we're looking to address those areas. So even as today, we are hiring uh, additional English teachers, Spanish teacher, social science teacher, and multiple subject teachers to meet the needs of high class sizes. This is something that has been brought to us over time. And we've been continuing to look at it. And at this time, we found that we have found the way to work around and, ad and address these needs in these high class areas, class size areas, excuse me. There are also significant resources in regards to protective equipment to address, um, to address the safety needs of students and staff. Uh, the numbers you see before you are currently in our possession in the warehouse, stored in our warehouses. Uh, we also have, orders coming in daily. We had an order of masks that came in today that we'd ordered as we start to prepare and have these available for both staff and students if we do come back. Um, we have additional, as, as you see, we have a, an additional 454,000 worth of, uh, worth of prote uh, personal protective equipment that is scheduled and we are monitoring and this is all to be delivered prior to August 1st. Um, so we are looking forward to having that on hand so we have the materials needed for whatever phase that we end up uh, serving our students in. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Superintendent Corey. These next slides are a timeline. You've seen them before. And they are just um, to indicate how quickly and rapidly things change. So if you just continue, you can see um, it's almost every other day or a week or just a few days between some things. And then on this slide, um, it shows what has happened now, um, following the following slide, thank you. What has happened since our last board meeting? So if you take a look at this, you notice that Solano County, since our last board meeting was placed on the state's watch list. And um, we started our virtual academy. We've been enrolling students. We started some in-person summer school. And then um, as early as this last Monday, Governor Newsom ordered closures for counties on the state watch list, which did include Solano County. Next slide, please. Here's what our timeline is. Um, on Tuesday, we met with our associations. Tonight, we are presenting some options to the governing board. On Monday, we will hold a specially gov special governing board meeting at 5 p.m to determine the phase we will start in. And then between July 20th and August 18th, not, will they may change, it most, most assuredly things will change. Due to these changes though, we can't continue to keep coming back and forth. Our parents, our students and our staff need a firm commitment on a reopening plan um, that they can start planning for. So we do need to re or to uh, make sure we commit to a reopening phase. All right, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, just 28 days ago, we shared a plan with our governing board and we now have 33 days until our official start of school, which is August 19th. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Sheila McCabe, Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services. In April, staff determined that the district needed to provide families with options for the opening of the 2021 school year. At that point in time, we were just starting to develop a return to school phased plan. 
However, we recognize that some families would not want their children to return to school and instead have access to distant learning model. On May 21st, the governing board took action to approve the establishment of the Virtual Academy of Fairfield Sassoon. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Melissa Farrar to provide an update on our new school. Thank you, Dr. McCabe. The two options available for families who do not want their students to return to school are the Virtual Academy for our elementary students and the Long-Term Independent Study Program for our secondary students. Next slide, please. There has been lots of progress on the opening of the Virtual Academy since my last update. We're pleased to announce that the Virtual Academy of Fairfield Sassoon has been approved as a school by the California Department of Education. We've begun the registration process for families wishing to enroll in the school. The registration forms have been posted on social media as well as to the district website. Additionally, registration information and forms were emailed to families who expressed interest earlier in the summer. Forms should be returned by July 31st to secure enrollment in the virtual academy. With an MOU in place, we've moved forward with the hiring of teachers for the school. We have also secured professional development specifically for the virtual academy teachers to occur before school starts, as well as ongoing support throughout the year. Dr. McCabe? Thank you, Dr. Farrar. In initial school option, the district also created a five-phase continuum, which would help us achieve our goal of delivering the most effective instruction possible while protecting the health of our staff and students. Before we outline the stage, Assistant in the Business Services, Michelle Henson, will be explaining state requirements regarding attendance and counting. Ms. Henson. Thank you. Thank you. Attendance reporting is extremely important for districts to track not just for the benefit of students, but also because it is a significant driver of the district's local control funding. When districts were compelled to shut down quickly during the spring, the state allowed flexibility and waived any potential penalties or loss of funding when they weren't able to meet the minimum instructional minutes or days. There will be different expectations for the upcoming school year. Requirements for annual instructional minutes and PE minutes will be waived but requirements for daily instructional minutes and the minimum number of instructional days will not. SB 98 includes flexibility for how districts can meet their instructional days and instructional minute requirements. The intent is not to prevent districts from employing distance learning, hybrid or mixed delivery instructional models. If district learning is employed, instructional time would be calculated using a time value of assignments similar to what we already know for independent study. And for hybrid days, instructional time would be a combination of time spent with the teacher and this time value of assignments. Next slide, please. Districts are required to take attendance, even with distance learning. The district must have a weekly engagement record for each student and a student who does not participate must be marked absent for that day. If the student misses more than 60% of distance learning in a school week, then the district must have a tiered re-engagement strategy in place. And now back to you, Dr. McKay. Thank you. During the June 4th governing board meeting, staff shared information about the work of a comprehensive committee that was formed to develop a plan for the reopening of school facilities. During the June 18th governing board meeting, staff provided an overview of the parent guardian and staff survey results, as well as an outline of the five phase continuum plan. During that meeting, we discussed that the plan needed to be fluid and responsive based on the ever changing conditions in our state, our county and our community. The five phase continuum has the most restrictive setting or phase one with 100% of the students in distance learning and the least restrictive setting or phase five with 100% of the students returning with no restrictions. While the plan needed to be fluid, the committee identified safety protocols that needed to be implemented in phase two, phase three, and phase four of the plan. Ms. Angie Avalanitas will be discussing those safety protocols. As part of our reopening of schools committee led by Kristen Witt, 
the committee started the process of creating a five-phase continuum plan to inform families and staff of safety precautions we are taking in every phase of the continuum. Before you are the safety precautions we are taking while in phases two through four. Our safety precautions were developed with the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the California Department of Education, and the Solano County Public Health Guidance in mind. Outlined before you are some of those key precautions. Next slide, please. Additional safety precautions outlined before you provide us protocols to follow to minimize exposure to COVID-19. We continually monitor guidance, specifically any updates and or changes to guidance from the various agencies to ensure our safety precautions are up to date. We have weekly ongoing collaborative meetings with various departments to determine next steps related to training for students and for our staff. We are also working on a start of school year guide for families, which will include a detailed breakdown of the five phase continuum and steps we are taking to minimize exposure in each phase. We anticipate having the guide distributed to families by August 10th, the latest. Finally, we're also collaborating with various departments on a subsequent handbook for our staff. Dr. McCabe. Thank you. The most restrictive environment on the continuum is 100% distance learning. As stated on this slide, we learned a great deal in spring. At a workshop I attended last week, the speaker, the speaker referred to what took place in March, April, May, and June as pandemic learning. In fact, he said we have to stop calling that distance learning. That description could not be more accurate. We took a system that was 200 years in the making and attempted to recreate it in 14 days. In addition, because of the shifts happening for our students and staff, we lowered expectations. We held kids not um, we held kids frozen on their grades and lowered graduation requirements in order to ensure our kids could graduate. If and when we have to implement phase one, Distance learning will look much different than what the students and staff experienced in the spring. To bring about those changes, staff is coordinating professional development. Sessions include how to teach in an online setting and the digital tools that are part of our adopted curriculum. We also know there must be greater accountability. Daily attendance will need to be taken and a more rigorous follow up for our students who are not attending. Grades and credit should not be modified. And in addition, staff will need to maintain evidence of completed student work. Finally, we'll need to provide more structure to the day. In the spring, there were daily check-ins, but much of, that, much of the instruction was delivered asynchronous. In other words, not with the teacher and the student together at the exact same time. In phase one, staff will be providing more live instruction every day. In fact, our goal will be that this structure will closely align to the structure of our virtual academy, not necessarily exactly like our virtual academy, but very closely aligned. As families are, are weighing their options for the upcoming school year, we often get the question, what's the difference between phase one and the virtual academy? Before we talk about the differences, I thought it'd be important for the board to know that there are many similarities. In addition to having a credential teacher and a dependence on technology, both settings will be using the same curriculum. In fact, in order to have the Virtual Academy of Fairfield Sassoon approved as a school of choice by the California Department of Education, we had to certify that the children in the academy did use the same curriculum that they would have had if they were in a traditional setting. So why might a family select the Virtual Academy if we start school in phase one? We anticipate during the course of the 2021 school year, we will move out of phase one and into other phases on the continuum. If a family wants stability in their educational setting, then they should enroll in the virtual academy or the independent study program. In addition, our expectation is that the virtual academy is gonna grow as a school even after the country returns to normal. As such, there's opportunities to build community that are embedded in the structure of the school. While we're in phase one, we might not be able to coordinate some of those planned community-based activities. 
but we will be incorporating them as we move into phase two, three, four, and five. In phase two through phase four, they're very similar with the biggest difference being the approximate number of students who will be in each class and on campus at any given time. First, it's important to note that in all of the that all of the safety protocols that Ms. Abuelitas described on slides 25 and 26 will be in place in phases two, three, and four. In phase two, about 25% of the students will return daily, which would mean that they are going to receive 20% of their instruction via distance learn. I'm sorry, 20% of their instruction for in person and 80% of their instruction in distance learning. In phase two, staff is also looking at a strategy where our students in our regional special education programs would be able to return more than one day per week. To the best of our ability, the students would be cohorted. At the elementary level, each teacher's classroom would become a cohort. At the secondary level, those cohorts are larger because the academic pathways don't allow for us to keep students in the smaller groups. The secondary team is working with the ARIES modules to cohort students by content area. We have found that working with PE and electives makes that a little bit harder. And so that's one of the reasons why their cohorts are going to be much larger than just a group of 24 to 30 students. Phase three is similar to phase two in that all the safety protocols are in place and that we will continue to put a cohort kids. In phase three, about 50% of the students would return daily, which would mean the students would receive 60% of their instruction via distance learning and 40% of their instruction in person. The plan is that two of those groups, so for example, if we took the example above where kids might've come just one day a week, the kids coming on Tuesday and Wednesday would be clustered together as a new group, and the kids coming on Thursday and Friday would be clustered together and to form a new group. An example would be in phase one, we might have in a class group A, group B, group C, and group D, and group A and B would come together as a group in phase two, and group C and D would come together as a group in phase two. Again, all of the safety protocols would be in place in phase three on the continuum. In phase four, all of the students would return each day with all of the safety protocols in place and still cohorting students. In phase four, students would receive 100% of their instruction in person. Again, all the safety protocols would be in place in phase four on the continuum. In phase five, the conditions are such that we no longer have to have safety protocols in place. We don't anticipate being able to implement phase five until the pandemic is considered over, or at least over for Solano County. I'd now like to turn it back over to Superintendent Corey to share our recommendation. With all of those things to consider, it is our recommendation that we no longer open in phase four of our plan. Our recommendation is that we reopen campuses in either phase one, which is distance learning, or phase two, which is 25% of our students on campus, no more than 25% of our students on campus at one time. And this is order in order to minimize the risk to our best efforts possible. And you can see what that, this is a visual of what that would look like. Next slide. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. McCabe to talk about the um, benefits and some of the challenges or drawbacks that we have with each of these phases. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. As the board weighs this decision, staff thought it would be important to provide you what we see as the benefits and challenges of each option. In phase one, 100% distance learning provides the least amount of risk for staff and students and aligns to what many other districts, colleges, and universities are planning. In meeting with union leadership earlier this week, 
the CSEA president and field representative shared that they highly recommend opening in this phase. In addition, the FSUDA president shared that in a survey of their members, 75% of those who completed the survey favored opening in phase one. The challenges are that in phase one, it also provides the least amount of support for students and can lead to greater academic gaps, especially for our most at-risk students. Phase two, in which students participate in 80% distance learning and 20% instruction, allows some in-person connection between students and teachers. The small groups allow for greater social distancing in the classroom, and it also allows both students and staff to reintegrate into the school setting. The challenge, in addition to the challenges identified in phase one, there's also a concern regarding availability and staff. First, we have staff who fall into the vulnerable population. In addition, given the current spread in our community, it is not unreasonable to anticipate that we will have staff who will have to self quarantine even for exposure outside of the workplace. These two factors can impact a school and the entire district. I'm now gonna turn it over to Executive Director of Administrative Services and Community Engagement, Mr. Tim Gorey, to talk about what other districts are doing. Mr. Gorey. Thank you, Dr. McCabe. While we don't necessarily make our decisions based on what other districts are doing, it can be helpful to consider the information. So we compiled this list of current reopening decisions of school districts in our area, and it's up to date as of yesterday afternoon. While this list looks extremely lopsided toward 100% distance learning, I would like to note that two of the three districts in Solano County that have made a decision decided on a hybrid model, while two others have yet to decide. Clearly, However, school districts in more densely populated areas are overwhelmingly choosing to start in 100% distance learning. When districts, what, when districts decide does matter. Every day we gather more information and the environment we are working with changes, sometimes dramatically. While this fact tends to encourage us to wait to make final decisions or to change our decisions on a regular basis, a balance must be struck with tendencies and the need to create and plan for a stable environment in which students and staff can effectively work. Superintendent I just want, Corey. yes, I just want to add to Ms. Corey mentioned um, local, local surrounding school, school districts. districts. I've been almost on a daily basis in contact with my superintendent colleagues from Mount Solano County. And um, even though some of those districts have already approved and made recommendations, their boards too are also considering what those um, decisions were and if they will change prior to the start of school. Just wanna mention that our timeline is to reconvene the governing board on Monday at 5 p.m. for our special meeting. Following that meeting, we will hold an informational meeting on Thursday, July 23rd. And if people would like to attend that meeting in person, it's going to be held here at, at the central office in the boardroom beginning at 9 a.m. We will be maintaining phys physical distancing between adults, so space will be li limited. Um, if you don't want to attend in person, we will be making this recorded informational meeting available and release it to social media at 5.30 p.m. on July 23rd, and that's pending, no technical difficulties. We think we have our mics fixed, and so hopefully it won't be a problem. It is now time for board discussion. Um, what I'd like to hear from board, um, from board members, what their thoughts are about the reopening, and also just if there's any additional information that you as a board member will need us to provide on Monday for you because we will do our best to um, work from now, Thursday until Monday uh, to get that information available to you. Board member or board president Honeychurch. Okay. Are there any members that would like to have some additional information? Yes, ma'am. Madam okay. Chair. Yes, David. 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 Yeah, thank you. And thank you, uh, Dr. McCabe. 
Tim and Chris for this uh, this uh, presentation. So if you want to know kind of where I'm leaning, I'm, I'm not leaning anywhere. I'm 100 percent um, in favor of 100 percent distant learning. Having said that, because of the safety of our kids, I right away must say my immediate concern then is the education of our kids. We have seen the pros and cons. And in looking at that, what I would like to uh, say is right now we have phase one, here's what it is, period. Phase two, here's what it is, period. I'd like to maybe see phase 1.1 where it's phase one is 100% virtual. However, we need to come be, become creative with supporting our kids. None of that's mentioned in, 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 in the phase one where we can do some strategic support of the students that need uh, in-person work. For example, a couple of years ago, we were working with um, the teachers union um, who were concerned with all of the supplemental education services that we were using. And some of the teachers themselves said, hey, we, we can teach off, 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 off our hours. We can, we can tutor, why, why don't you hire us? So I'm looking to, I'm hoping that we can see a way to bring other agencies on board that are willing to teach our kids. Uh, I don't know how that would look financially and what we would have to pull back on and some other things. However, with phase one distant learning 100%, there needs to be a way to guarantee that children that need to be seen by an instructor are. The other thing and last thing I want to say is if we're at I've gotten a bunch of emails, as many have, and a bunch of phone calls, a bunch of text messages from teachers uh, who are pro opening the school and teachers who are against opening the school. So if the teachers themselves can 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 put a pool together of their own th themselves, you know, they can meet and say, hey, I want to work. I don't. Whoever doesn't and somehow match those teachers who want to work during this time. Give them the opportunity to do so and match them with the kids that need work, work in person, work in person, work in person. Yeah, I'm sorry. Because right, everybody was... will be working for I'm, sure. Yeah, yeah, mine is, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Wilson. Um, I'm also leaning in fa toward phase one. Um, I'd like more information on what the secondary cohorts might look like. Uh, some typical scenarios. I can picture an elementary school when we go into phase, uh, the reopening phases, but uh, I, I can't picture the secondary. So I'd be interested in uh, seeing what more in more particular what the plan might look like in practice. I'm also interested in what it would be like for parents who choose to enroll in the virtual school the entry process and the exit process for that. Uh, I gather there's some uncertainty in the community over that process, and I'd like to hear that described. Um, those are the, let me see, those are the things that I'm interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Anyone else? Yeah, can I? actually uh, piggyback on um, what Craig has said about uh, the cohorts. I'm actually, I, I'm a visual person and I'm having trouble visualizing how any of them look, be it elementary or secondary, if if we can somehow diagram that out instead of a list of bullet points, that would, I think, be really helpful to me. Um, I think where my confusion lies is we're saying 25% of the kids are going to be on campus, um, but you know, are we saying there's still an entire classroom full of children or only 25% of those children are going to be there in that classroom? So our thought is that it would be 25% of those classrooms, uh, those students would be in person in that classroom so that, um, you know, if you take a classroom of, uh, I'm just going to use a round number of 24. So we would have one day of everybody doing distance learning then one day six kids would six students would come next day a different six the follow next day a different six and the following day a different six so that everybody okay, would you. get one day of instruction so it wouldn't be so that's that was our envision now it'd have to be a little bit different at the high school and we know that 
um, if we did phase phase two, because there are um, some ways that scheduling would prohibit us to do that. And we may have to have some classes, even if we were to um, bring back 25% of the kids, there would be some classes that we would just have to do distance learning, um, you know, the entire class online. Okay. And um, I, I think I'll save a lot of my commentary until Monday, but um, I did want to just, I, I had somebody say something to me earlier today, which I thought was odd, but, um, you know, they know that we're under a lot of pressure <laughs> to reopen schools. And I, for one, have not felt like that was a, a factor at all. I've not felt pressured. I'm not sure where that perception might have come from, but I definitely have not. And, um, you know, I just want to instill confidence in, uh, you know, members of the public and those families that, and say, you know, if, if I'm personally not going to be willing to send my student back to a classroom, then, you know, I, I would not vote to put somebody else's in a classroom. But um, I am along with others and definitely leaning towards the phase one. I think that there's just, it, I think if nothing else, it gives us some time to um, kind of make sure that we've got it right before we get kids in seats. Um, and just lastly, uh, I'd like to know about professional development that um, is being provided uh, for distance learning purposes. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, next, Jonathan. Thank you, Madam President. The school district's primary responsibility is to educate students. And traditionally, this has always been um, in a face-to-face -face, um, experience that we all have grown to know and have experienced up until this <laughs> pandemic. Um, as FSUSD has proudly been able to overcome many obstacles, um, this pandemic has tested us beyond what we could ever imagine. And because of that, I have the utmost confidence in our leadership, their decisions, and their recommendations to the board in regards to the safety of not only our primary stakeholders, our students, but our teachers and their families throughout the community. I support the distance learning aspect of this. However, what's essentially important for me to communicate publicly is that there must be a unilateral commitment by parents, community members, our teachers, and our students to help us to win the battle against the pandemic and what it has caused in interrupting our school district and districts across the country and across the world. Um, it's been very interesting hearing the frustrations of different people um, but I've been able to absorb that without creating any type of interaction because I wanted, one, to hear everything and see and read everything that was provided. But also, I noticed that there's few solutions, um, but a lot of frustration and concern, which is understandable. Again, the primary focus that I think that all of us must embrace is the strength of becoming the community of FSUSD making sure that our students have all the support that they need um, and having creativity beyond what we could ever imagine to innovate our homes, our virtual spaces, and the opportunity to continue to build resilient students um, that can overcome anything in the world. And I believe this experience is a testament to who these students will be for the future because if they can overcome this, they can literally overcome anything else the world throws. Um, I would like to see best practices for parents um, in this because um, I've had some colleagues um, from the community with some concerns regarding what they would be able to do as a parent with the limitations of their employment and their limitations of not being an educator and trying to keep their students on track. Two, the support for parents regarding their need um, to either learn or have access to some of the technology 
that would help them to support their student so that they are not overwhelmed um, in an extraordinary way that causes for them to be frustrated, leading to frustration for the student. Um, ultimately, as I close, creativity and collaboration is the thing that we must stress. If we all do not come to the table as board members, as executive cabinet, as teachers, as community members, as the parents, as the students, as the relatives, we will not win. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, anyone else uh, have some? John? Oh, uh, yeah, I have a. And then Joan. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I would like to thank everybody that uh, put in so much effort and work into making these different phases uh, possible if they're, you know, regardless of which direction we go. And I think we all know that what happens tomorrow with the governor may govern entirely what we're going to do. So, you know, that said, uh, a lot of what we may be saying may, may be a mute point right now. But uh, either way around, it doesn't mean that we don't have our, our feelings and our beliefs of how we should go about it if we have a choice. But, uh, you know, if, if we do, did go to any kind of physical learning, you know, my concern would be, you know, do the teachers have, what would we have teachers, enough teachers in a classroom uh, to teach those particular classes? So the teachers that don't do not want to be there wouldn't have to be there. Uh, so that that that's a concern, and, and I don't know where that how those percentages you know slot out. But uh, regardless of what we do, I, I think we should also consider uh, extracurricular activities that are not, you know, they're, they're not actually part of the learning environment. For instance, sports and band, and you know, some of those things, you know, could they somehow go on, in spite of the fact that the actual education itself is not happening in a classroom. Uh, so that, that might be important. And, uh, you know, we don't shut everything down if, if we shut it down, you know, if, if we go to distance learning. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, I feel that it's, it, you know, there's a lot happening uh, right now, uh, you know, in, in our, in our, even in our own area, you know, we're, we're on a pretty upward spike right now. And uh, of course, that could completely change in 33 days. But as of right now, uh, you know, California is on the upswing, and as soon as we <laughs> open, it started to to spike up. So I would I would hate to have our district, you know, be the ones that how to learn and, and learn it in that way. Uh, you know, when we could watch what's going on around us too, uh, and and see how it actually pans out for those people who do physical learning. So. I, I think on a personal level, with, without whatever the governor has to say and, and without us knowing more, uh, I think I am more into uh, the distance learning myself also, because uh, it's, it's even though that's a tough situation, we can perfect it. And if we do perfect it, uh, I don't think it's a bad thing. And I, I realize that being in school has been happening for a long time and virtual is pretty new. But uh, we moved pretty fast uh, in the first in the first part of this since March, and and uh, a lot of we to be able to, uh, perfect it pretty well and do pretty well with uh, you know with grading and, and learning. So I, I guess we'll wait till see it tomorrow what happens, and then on on Monday you know we'll 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 you know hammer it out for for good. So that's kind of what where I'm standing on on some of this. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, I do am leaning toward phase one, distance learning to come President back. To the on the side of President the Honeychurch. President um, Honeychurch, Ms. Yes. Scott had something yes. she wanted to say. I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to be oh, forgotten. I'm sorry. I forgot, Joan. I apologize. That's yeah, okay. I okay. Um, wait. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to all the people that have contacted me both in person and on the telephone and by texting and with emails, because I know that this is very, very serious to all of you. And I feel like, like I have to listen to what everyone says to be able to come up with some kind of an idea of how to proceed. I'm really fascinated by the 
the fact that all of the, my friends that are doctors that have contacted me want their children back in physical school. They do not want them on virtual school. The nurses that have contacted me want their children back in school. And these are people on the front line who deal with this straight out. They are all saying, quote, children do not get this. It's just not happening. We need to put our kids back in school. Um, for better or worse, these are the folks that are lobbying me to put their kids back. I'm also being told that parents that are that are going to have the most severe problems is where they have two parents working in the house and they won't have anybody to be able to be there to watch that their child actually is going online and doing the virtual learning. They won't be able to have child care as such because the child care, um, I guess you would call it the system or the employment group would be overwhelmed with the numbers of kids. And so they're really concerned about what in the world am I going to do with my child when we both have to go back to work? Um, and then finally, even the parents that have one parent that's able to stay home and teach their child or, or make sure that their child is learning online it, are still feeling very inadequate. And the, the frequent complaint that I hear about it has to do with something called common core math. They feel totally overwhelmed with that. Even the ones that are highly educated are feeling totally overwhelmed with something called common core math. And those are the kinds of things that make me concerned about having just online or virtual school available. I, I'm hopeful that we will be able to come up with a plan that will give people choice. Um, in the end, I, I don't see how we can solve the problems without doing choice for teachers that want to come back and for students that want to come back, even if it's just one school that opened. I, I think it would be worth looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, did I miss anyone? Okay. Uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, I am for starting out with phase one, and I know that that's not a perfect decision for everyone. And I have a lot of opinions, uh, agree with a lot of opinions that previous board members have made. Uh, one thing I would like to know uh, Monday is what indicators would we use or where would we have the indicators to move from phase one to phase two to phase three? How would that be done and what would we look at? Um, other than that, my other questions were taken care of by what other board members have said. Any other comments by board member? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, uh, Madam, yeah, I just, I sent an, a, a note. I just wanted to make sure the other thing I would like to see if there's possible uh, for the teachers that want to come into the classroom so we'll know who they are. So the children that can benefit from them being in the classroom, if there's a way of knowing that, if not just a number of them, somehow to know if we can match that up. Okay. Anyone uh, okay. I, I do have, I do want to just, um, review so to make sure that I have everything. So what I heard is um, you would like to see what strategic support, whether it's in person or what strategic support, if we could in person support in phase one. Um, and what are some ideas on that? We do have some ideas. Uh, Dr. McCabe has been working with some local vendors and also um, we'll be able to speak with our associations and see um, if that is a possibility working with that. And then also um, we heard about the virtual academy. You'd like more information on uh, the entry and exit process. Um, there was an idea of visualizing what a cohort and trying to do a visual of what that would look like, some type of di diagram. I don't know if we'll be able to get a list of teachers. I'll need to talk with our uh, the president of our teachers union about this issue because, as I said, all of um, these things are negotiated. Professional development, we do have a very robust plan for professional development with distance learning, and we can um, bring that forward to the board. Also, the best practices for parents and support for parents. Um, we have a document. Uh, that we can provide. I'm just looking at it right now. Um, we're going to add a parent uh, tip section to our guide for families. And so that's a great idea and we'll add that. Uh, the other question was about sports and extracurricular 
uh, activities if they can continue in person. And I know that CIF, I believe tomorrow is gonna be bringing and putting out their guidance for us. And so we can add that information uh, for Monday. And, um, and then just if there's a possibility of choice, even if uh, we had some classrooms or uh, some schools open, uh, we can look uh, as at that as a option. So did I miss anything or is that everything? Did you um, mention Superintendent Corey about how we move from one page to the other, what data we look oh, at? Oh, thank you. Okay. So indicators on that. All right. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Um, Ms. Honeychurch, what I'm gonna ask is if we can just take a very brief break and if you could switch places with me and present from in here, cause then you don't have to use your headphones because they are kind of garbled. Okay, thank you. Let's take a brief break, thank you. Okay, I am in the other room. All right. Awesome. We will now move on to C, written report, Solano County investment report, third quarter 2019-20, ending March 31st, 2020. Again, there's no presentation. Uh, are there any public comments? No, there are. Uh, President, Corey. President Honey Perch, are are you still using your headphone? Am I what? No, okay. Did you close the door closed? Okay. Thank you. Okay, do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, any board discussion? Okay, may I have a motion to approve? Move approve, Wilson. Wait, I'm sorry. Are, are this is not, to... this, these are reports. These are not, this yeah. is not action items. These are reports. Yeah, there's no, there's no need for any action. Oh, on pardon items. me. Thank you, Mr. Isom. Sorry. All right. Uh, e, written report. An annual report from District English Learner Advisory uh, Committee uh, regarding programs and services for English learners. No presentation. Any public comment? Okay. There's Hearing no none, public board comment. Discussion. Did you do, uh, President Honeychurch, did you do D? Yes the migrant education program? 
Say that again, please. The yes. migrant? Yes. Okay, go ahead. No, maybe she didn't. I don't think she did D. I thought I did D. Part. No. Okay. Maybe you didn't. Sorry. We've done C, we've done E. I'll go back to D. The 2019-20 annual report on status of migrant education program. Are there any public speakers? There are no public Here. speakers. Any board discussion? Okay, so now we've done C, D, E. Going on to F, written report, quarterly report on Williams uniform complaints, no presentation, any public comment? No public comment. Okay, board discussion. Moving on to employee organization reports. Um, do we have, it looks like we have Nancy Dunn from F Suda. Yes, Would I'm you here. like to speak, Nancy? Yes, can you, can you hear me? We can. Awesome, thank you so much. This is a new experience for me. So thank you, good evening. President Honeychurch, governing board members, Superintendent Corey and community members. I am Nancy Dunn, president of Fairfield Sassoon Unified Teachers Association. Earlier this week, I shared with Superintendent Corey the results of our latest FSUDA membership survey and I'm sure she has passed the data along to you. We surveyed our members to learn which of the various models for the reopening of schools about one month from tomorrow uh, they could support. 724 unit members responded to the survey within 48 hours. 70% of those who participated in the survey favored the opening of schools with 100% distance learning. It is not easy for our members to advocate for distance learning. We want to be back in school with our students. We know distance learning is inequitable for our students. We are afraid for the safety of some of our students, especially those who are food or economically insecure. However, we must only reopen schools to in-person learning when it is safe for students and adults to do so. We believe it is unsafe to reopen in a hybrid model with the Solano County numbers of COVID-19 cases on the increase. We believe if we continue distance learning for the short term, we will more quickly get to the point when we can reopen our school sites and welcome our students. As a small update to the presentation you just saw, we understand that Vallejo is no longer pending, but is now reopening with 100% distance learning. Elk Grove Unified has also shifted from its hybrid model to 100% distance learning model. Teachers cannot teach and students cannot learn when they are sick or fearful of becoming so. That is why FSUDA joined with all the other local associations in Solano County in a unity statement, placing safety as the top priority. We look forward to learning your decision on Monday so we can then determine if that safety threshold is met, allowing us to support the reopening plan. One thing I hope we can all be in support of between now and November is a robust and coordinated effort to pass Proposition 15, the Schools and Community First Proposition. When Prop 15, uh, when passed, Prop 15 will provide the money schools need during the pandemic and beyond by taxing commercial and industrial property market value rather, rather than, than the purchase, purchase price. price. It, it does, does not raise the taxes of individuals or property zoned as commercial agriculture. Passage of Prop 15 will move funding from the bottom third in the nation to the top third of the nation. After the recent budget scare this year, school boards and labor associations can unite on ensuring a stable revenue source that more appropriately funds public education. 
I hope we do not miss this opportunity to work together on this critical issue and collaboratively develop a strong campaign to be sure that voters in Solano County pass Proposition 15. In so many ways, the election this November will chart the course moving forward for schools in Fairfield Sassoon. We must not let passing this proposition be lost in the craziness of reopening schools in a pandemic. Our members more than ever understand the impact federal, state, and local government officials have on their lives. They are energized to use the power of their votes to reimagine schools moving forward. Please keep yourself safe and thank you for your time and attention this evening. Thank you, Nancy. Do we have any other organization reports? No, there are no other organizational reports. Thank you. Student board member report is, I don't, is Chantel? Hello. Hi. Have a report? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. For my report, I would just like to highlight the student board member symposium, which I attended on July 1st. I believe it was very informational as I was able to learn about items such as my roles and responsibilities as a student board member, serving, presentation skills, finances, and even a little bit about the Brown app. I also had the opportunity to meet a few other student board members from across the state. I'm really glad I was able to attend the symposium and I plan to incorporate what I learned into my duties as a student board member. And with that, I conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. We move on to I, superintendent report. Chris, Chris. Thank you, President Honeychurch. Um, I mentioned this to you in a Friday letter, and I stated that trying to take a vacation or a break during this time is like me trying not to eat salt and vinegar kettle chips. Uh, it's impossible. Um, there, I just want to shout out to all of our staff, because even though technically it is um, summer break for our teachers, I know our teachers are working, our administrators are working nonstop and i just can't um, thank everybody enough for their dedication it's the hours that have gone into this work have been astronomical and what i just want to reiterate is everybody really is trying to do the best that we can with the information that we have at the time and so um, you know it hurts us when we hear that maybe we don't care or that we're um, on purpose trying to hurt somebody or put people in harm's way. And that's definitely not the case. We really are thinking about what's best for our students and what's best for our staff. And we know that after we get through all of this, we'll come out of this situation even stronger than we were when we went in. And so please just be patient with us. We're doing our best. Um, We've been keeping up with all the emails and the phone calls, usually within 24 to 48 hours, you get a response. And so um, we'll continue to um, put our best foot forward. I do wanna just encourage people who want to attend in person for our town hall meeting to do so. A questionnaire will be going out this evening via social media and we'll do it in a similar format as the last one. Our goal is to get somebody from Solano County Public Health to attend this meeting so that they can answer some of those questions that people would like from a medical professional. With that, I just want to once again um, send my accolades to my um, the amazing staff in Fairfield Sassoon and um, thank them again for all their hard work. That ends my report. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. We now move to public communication. This is the opportunity for the public to address items that are not on the board meeting agenda. Public comment is only permitted on matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Do we have any public uh, comment? 
Madam President, we have two public speakers. The first for tonight will be Mr. Carl Shortino, followed by Mr. George Gwynn in that order. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Carl Short. I spoke earlier in regards to the school opening, and I want to speak to that a little bit more now that I have more information, thanks to the wonderful presentation. I do think it's important that we go with the phase one, only because, like some of the board members stated, when California started opening up, that's when we spiked. If we start opening up the schools, we give the virus, the opportunity to spread, which is going to cause more cases, right? I mean, that's, it's pretty basic. Um, and then I also want to talk about the, uh, the thing that I suggested before and in regards to the costs that the district is incruing just in the PPP, PPE and in the new staff, you're hiring six nurses, you're hiring more janitors, you're hiring more teachers. You're, you have $500,000 in PPE, you have masks and everything else. And I know that that money has to come from somewhere. So again, I want to suggest that the contract with the Fairfield Police Department to have the uh, site resource officers on, on grounds, which if you go with distance learning, again, there are no grounds, should be looked at. I mean, it seems like a no brainer to me. Um, I can tell you that me and some other people with the Fairfield Change Organization have been going to the city council meetings and we are talking with them in regards to the police budget and how the police are tasked to do a lot of jobs that they're not trained to do. They're not trained to deal with mental health issues. They're not trained to deal with homeless issues. They're not trained to deal with a lot of things they do. As far as I'm concerned, they're really not trained to deal with the traffic issues that most of them do because they're overtrained for that, right? Like that shouldn't be part of their job. So I know that we have school counselors already at most sites, which are trained much more so than the police to deal with those specific issues that the police on site now are dealing with. So I think that in that way, the, the school board is spending money on something that it doesn't really need to spend money on. And it's $395,000 that the school board is spending money on this coming school year. Uh, that's a large number. And uh, I think it should be considered. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, I can talk. Um, hi, this is uh, George Gwynn. I um, was aiming to uh, send you guys a, uh, a link to a video you need to see about mass, but um, I had a lot of other emails to do and I didn't get to it. So right after the meeting tonight, I'll, I'll go ahead and send it to you. The thing of it is, is um, one of the things you should get out of this video is that um, Masks should be worn when people actually are sick. If they're not sick, the mask actually makes it harder for people to breathe and they're breathing uh, more carbon dioxide and it's better for them not to have masks. Um, I think also the governor's kind of overextended his authority. He's an executive and uh, he's not supposed to make law that's made by the uh, uh, legislature and then the uh, courts are supposed to review that. But uh, the uh, governor is trying to say uh, you have to wear a mask regardless. There's eight exemptions from that, and I hope you guys will go by that. It was the June 18th, uh, 2020 memo from the uh, State Department of Health. Um, it's um, also um, a, a problem for you guys to, where the money's coming from. I, I think you need to be careful before you defund the police. The police do serve a vital function. 
if you don't have order, uh, you're going to have um, things like what happened up in Seattle, where they um, have mobs take over the police station and destroy uh, government property, which the taxpayers will have to pay for to fix. And um, it creates social unrest. You don't have order. We're supposed to be a nation of laws, and we should go by the laws that we have, not the uh, laws of the mob. Um, really uh, don't envy the position you guys are in because uh, there's not a lot of good choices um, sometimes, but um, you seem to be doing fairly well. The other thing I want to talk about is the uh, Nancy Dunn was uh, talking about uh, split role for uh, Prop 13. That will be a disaster if that ever passes. Um, you need to keep the uh, uh, keep Prop 13 the way it is. It um, will uh, create nothing but problems for the um, uh, county uh, assessor and, and recorder's office. Um, really uh, should not uh, even consider that one. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in the, the vote. I hope it uh, certainly doesn't uh, have another change. Thank you very much. Madam President, that concludes our public speakers for item 5A. Thank you very much. Moving on to the consent, pardon me, the consent calendar. Are there any items to be pulled from the consent calendar? Okay, looks like none. Any public comment on the consent, on the consent calendar? No public comment. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the consent now? Move approval. Sir, second. Second, Wilson. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Huntingchurch. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. I said I had my microphone off. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we will move on to action item 12, business services. Um, the first three bid are bid 12A, 12B, 12C. If we can take those all, to, all together, please. Are there any public comments on any of those? No public comment. Move Thank approval you. items A, B, and C. Second, Joan Goddard. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to 13 action items, human resources. A, review and potential approval of resolution number 02-2021, authorizing instructors to teach with a variable term waiver, no presentation, any public speakers? No public comment. Move Thank approval. You. That was Joan. Yes. Right. Second. Second. Jonathan. Roll call, please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Stephanie Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 14A, review and potential approval of new board policy 0470 COVID-19 mitigation plan. I will, are this, is there any public comment on this item? No public comment. I will turn it over now to Tim Gorey. Thank you, uh, President Honeychurch. Uh, this item is somewhat special that goes along with the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, it is board, a new board policy 0470. We received it um, in June from uh, the CSBA and it is a CSBA template that we have revised in very minor ways in the practice of our district. Um, its purpose, uh, well, number one, we didn't, we didn't bring it to the governance subcommittee like we normally would, and that's why I you today, uh, but because of the sensitive nature of it, we felt it was important to bring it to the entire board at this time. Um, the purpose of this policy is to give us an overall policy that specifically applies to mitigating COVID-19 in our school district. If we weren't to do this policy, we would likely be in a situation where our, us as staff would be bringing um, to uh, the board a number of different policies over time to revise to make sure that we're in compliance with board policy as we're doing uh, pretty significant and unusual things during COVID-19. This policy is meant to supersede all other policies that would disagree with it during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And then at the end of, of that pandemic, when it's, uh, when it's decided that we are done with that policy, the policy is meant to be brought back for the board to then uh, delete it or take it off of the board policy role. So um, that's the purpose of this policy. And I wanted to make sure that I also um, mentioned that uh, board member Gott uh, reached out to us uh, as she was reviewing this policy and made a couple of, uh, of uh, suggestions that, that staff uh, agrees is a good idea. And, and, but those suggestions may not be reflected in the policies that you have in the system uh, because they were brought to us a little bit later with a compressed time. And so I wanted to mention what those were. Um, staff agrees that uh, that replacing uh, physical distances, uh, distancing, uh, social distancing, excuse me, uh, throughout the document, there are 21 instances where the document refers to social distancing distancing, which we all are familiar with. Um, her suggestion was to replace that with the words physical distancing um, so that we, with an understanding uh, that we're not trying to distance people socially, that there are ways that we can pursue uh, social aspects of education even while we are physically distancing. And so uh, we thought that that was a good idea. Also, the second suggestion was in one instance uh, where a statement says on campus instruction may be prioritized for subjects that are difficult to deliver through distance learning, such as laboratory science, art, or career technical education. Um, board member Gott suggested putting the word music in front of or career technical education to include music um, as one of the suggestions um, of of uh, subjects that might be difficult to deliver through distance learning. This list is not meant to be exhaustive. There are certainly other subjects that could be considered this way and the, the statement allows for those other subjects, um, but her suggestion of adding music was well received and we uh, do suggest that that change uh, should be put into consideration for the board policy. Can I move approval at this point? <laughs> discussion. Discussion. I pushed the wrong button. Pardon me, uh, Mr. Wilson. Do you have a comment? Yes. Are we voting on uh, the policy that was included in the agenda packet, or on these verbal uh, changes that were just described? I think it matters how you. Uh, I would suggest that we move approval of the policy with the changes made by Mr. Glory. Do I have a no. motion for that approval? 
yes, that would be my motion if uh, we're ready to move forward. Then yes, I'm I'm glad that uh, Joan had the same thought as I did on the social distancing. I, I also submitted the same question and uh, said we can encourage social connectivity while discouraging physical proximity um, with just the changing of that one word from social to physical. So. Second, Joan Gott. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantel Martino. No. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. I think we're ready to move on to the next item. And oh, I'm item... sorry, I forgot to push the microphone button. Items 14B through 14O are all items from the Governance Subcommittee. Before turning it over to Craig Wilson, uh, are there any public comments on these items? Okay, I will turn it over to Mr. Wilson. Thank you. <clears throat> The items before you were carefully reviewed and discussed in the governance subcommittee meeting, June 24th. These are suggested changes, new CSBA policies or recommended policy deletions. The necessary changes have been made to match our district. I now present items 14B through 14O for your approval. Thank you. Move approval. Second. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> discussion. Can we have discussion? Yes. Go ahead, John. Okay. I am concerned about e uh, about F because in this one we're talking about having people using epinephrine auto injectors and opiate antagonists. And I'm concerned that people that are doing this need to be CPR trained, and that's not part of what's going on in that in that thing, or in that in that particular board policy. The other thing I'm I'm concerned about is I'm not sure we need this if we're going to hire all these LVNs and have a medical person on staff on every single campus when this is going on. I don't know that this one is even necessary anymore. So those are two questions I have about it. So now I go to. It's F. It's it's um, four one one two nine. Did the board want to um, send this back to committee or how did you want to move forward? I, I think you can go back to committee because at this point, if we're gonna be hiring all these LVNs, I don't know that we would even need to have any volunteers trained to do this. And I okay, certainly so want you to have PR training. Discussion, the uh, policy is Just about allow. employee yeah. notifications. It's yeah. not about hiring LVNs or how LVNs conduct their work. Is that correct? No, it has to do with asking volunteers to give epinephrine auto injections and opioid antagonists. And it doesn't say anything about having um, CPR training to do this. We can send it back to committee. Uh, I think we should move forward with this only because CPR has nothing to do directly with that specifically and considering what we are aiming to do as far as making sure that we have the necessary training. Have enough people trained to be available in the event of an emergency for a student. I think that this policy is sufficient um, for us to move forward with. At the end of the day, we're not required to have volunteers trained, but if we do, it's in our best interest to have people available to assist in an emergency situation when an LVN may or may not be as accessible in that moment. CPR certification isn't necessarily required for that purpose. Um, Any other comments? I concur with what Jonathan is saying. Okay, um, are we ready to have a motion to approve the um, 
You have a motion and a second. You have a motion and a second on the floor. Thank you. I'm sorry. I still have uh, one of these that I wanted to just quickly discuss. Um, can we talk about each very quickly? Yes. And um, so there, this is about maintaining appropriate adult student interactions. And um, I did uh, send my questions in the staff, but um, I'm just concerned with the way that it is written and uh, some of the items that it says, you know, that uh, it might be conduct that is considered inappropriate, um, you know, such as giving somebody a nickname or a, using a term of endearment or sharing personal, uh, you know, family or private matters. You know, there are plenty of times that those sorts of things are completely fine and they create connectedness and a sense of caring and you know i i just i, I don't know if, what it is about the wording of these that bothers me so much but um i'm not sure if there's a way to restructure it or maybe if somebody could speak to how it would actually be applied that it would make me feel more comfortable moving forward on it um superintendent i don't know if you want to address that I'm going to turn it over to um, Tim Gorey because this particular policy has gone through quite a few um, committees. We brought it to parent leaders, student leaders. Um, it went to all of our associations. And so I do want him to speak to this just a little bit, please. Sure. Thank you, um, Superintendent Gorey. We did go through an extensive process that included working with um, staff um, students and parents uh, to go through each one of these things. Uh, and, and the concern at the beginning, the reason we went through all of that was because of that wording. Uh, what we found as we spoke to um, especially students, uh, our student leadership group was uh, pretty clear on every single one of these that there are contexts in which um, they wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, but there are also contexts in which each one of those could be appropriate. And so um, we, we took a lot of pains in the, um, in the paragraph above the list of things to consider to really make it clear what it was that, that this policy is trying to do. And, and let me just read it because I think it's really important for people to understand these are not a list of things that are prohibited in any way but what they are is um is a list of uh, a, a list of 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 um items for all staff to consider and to help uh, uh, evaluate their own behavior so the idea here is it says being actively aware of potential abuses of authority requires employees to regularly examine their own conduct from different points of view and honestly assess whether or not their practices create the appearance of impropriety. To assist employees in this kind of self-assessment, some examples of employee conduct that may undermine professional adult student interactions or create the appearance of impropriety are listed below. So this is all they are. Sometimes these things are absolutely um, wonderful for creating great relationships with students. But in some contexts, some of these things like a nickname is not appropriate. And, and in some cases, students have been very clear that, that they don't want to be called by a nickname, even the nickname that sometimes adults would think would be um, nice or helpful. So um, this is really meant to be a mirror uh, for st all staff to look at and just help themselves say, look sort of get outside of themselves and look at this from different points of view each one of these items and ask themselves is this appropriate in this context and just to be a little more careful okay thank, thank you, you for, Tim, for the clarification are we ready now for the roll call uh craig um i studied the diff the changes that we made that our district made um, when this policy came out in September, October of last year to districts statewide, about half of them just adopted it word for word. 
and we pulled it and we've uh, dialed it back. It was a little bit stricter and I fully support what we've come up with. I admire it. For instance, the list, uh, the state model said inappropriate conduct and we reworded to say conduct that may be considered inappropriate. And there are several places where we've dialed back the strictness of it to so it would be a guideline and uh, I hope it'll be perceived that way. That's how I perceive there was a teacher who reached out to us with uh, objections and I spoke with her and explained it. And I, I assume the objections are mostly uh, gone away. And uh, I, I don't know if we have any public comment on this, but I don't, I think this will, uh, and the safeguards will be welcome in the district. You need to set a boundary. You need to be able to describe it. It's not a firm, rigid boundary, it's guidelines. And that was my experience on the subcommittee where we adopted this. Thank you. Can I make a comment, please? Yes, Joan, go ahead. I think probably this is more concerning to middle school and students than it is to, to the, the elementary, elementary school students. students. And that's why it bothers me because I, as a teacher, gave my phone number to students. And in all the 30 years, the all I had was one evening when some little girls had a sleepover and called me giggling at midnight. And I just explained to the ladies, come on, just go to bed and I'll see you tomorrow at school. And they stopped. If that's the only hassle I ever had with it. However, with the kids having my phone number and because I was in a Title I school, I was available to families and to kids that had problems. And when something happened, I was available to go and assist them and provide support and give them references for where they could get help. And it, it made things much easier for the students to know that that was available and that I cared that much to be able to be available to them. So I think probably if you look at it from the two different the two different aspects of which, which is this really aiming at, can be a real problem at the high school and middle school. I understand that. But for the little guys, it was, I, I, I just had a total feeling like, oh, good grief. But I understand why the high school people would have more issue with it. Thank you. Thank you. Are we now ready for the roll call? Okay, roll call, please. Do we have a motion? I thought we had, I thought David said we had a motion. We have, we have yes, a motion. We, do. we have a motion and a second. So. You had a motion and a second. Okay, roll call. Chantel Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Huntingchurch. Aye. Aye. David Isom. I'm sorry, aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries moving on to 16 information. A report budget update, Michelle Henson. Is there any public comment on this item? No public comment. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Michelle Henson. She is bringing up her presentation right now. Good evening, Board President Honeychurch, Superintendent Corey, and Governing Board members. Item 16A on tonight's agenda is an update to inform you of the impacts on the district's adopted budget now that the state's budget has been signed. The pre-COVID economy was strong, but the last four months have turned the nation's economy upside down. Consumer spending in the first quarter of this year is $211 billion less than its previous quarter. Consumption has declined, and it is feared that 42% of the job growth experienced over the last decade will be permanently lost. In addition to declining consumption, the state is facing the impacts and effects of declining tax revenues. While state residents welcome the personal tax deadline extension, the state is recording 48% fewer personal state tax returns filed in April compared to the prior year and only 120,000 corporate returns being filed compared to the last year. There is concern that the extension, while helpful, will not yield enough increase in returns to raise the level to normal and will ultimately impact revenue estimates for multiple years.
Hold on one second. We're just going to fix the screen here. That's this slide isn't presenting quite correctly. Thank you. The state budget reflects what many districts fear at a local level, declining revenues and from one year to the next and having to rely heavily on reserves. Nearly half of the rainy day fund will be drawn from during the 2021 fiscal year. The, whole thing. the rainy day fund, also known as the budget stabilization account, currently has about 16.1 billion. On June 25th, Governor Newsom issued an emergency proclamation, which allowed the state to draw from the budget stabilization account. However, law only allows the state to draw up to 50% of the balance in the first year of a budget emergency. That amount equates to 7.8 billion being taken from this fund. With daily changes to unemployment rates, declining revenues, and sustained economic shutdowns, the one thing that is certain about this budget is that it too will change. The possibility of a revised state budget is likely in early fall. Slide six shows you just how much has changed since the start of this year. January's proposal was optimistic. May's proposal was very pessimistic. And in the end, the enacted budget wasn't as bad as it could have been. However, what we are hearing is that as the rainy day fund is depleted, we are essentially just kicking the financial can down the road. The enacted budget brought news to the district that the cuts weren't going to be as bad as predicted at the May revise. The 45 day budget revision that staff is currently working on shows that instead of 182 million in LCFF revenues, we will be receiving 197 million. While this is much better than we anticipated, it is still over a $3 million cut from last year. It is also important to remember as we build our multi year projections that LCFF funding is now flat. And we are hearing that we should plan for a zero cost of living adjustment in the future years. One of the district's biggest fiscal challenges will be managing cash flow. The first deferral has already been implemented. A deferral meaning the state has a scheduled payment to the district, but is unable to make payment at this time and has indicated they will pay us at a later date. It's kind of a the checks in the mail scenario. This will happen with multiple scheduled payments over the next year. And as a result, the district will need to rely on borrowed money or reserves to continue with our own payments and payroll. The effects of these cash deferrals on our typical apportionment schedule for February through June of 21 are provided in this table. As a result of these deferrals, the district will only receive about 68% of the cash promised in the actual fiscal year. The rest will still be owed. The challenges the district and community face as we plan to return students to school in the upcoming year can only be solved by working together. We have little time afforded up to us to make these plans materialize and the views and opinions are often very far apart. It will be more important than ever to work in collaboration with our labor partners. Staff is currently working on the 45 day budget revision that will come to you at our next board meeting. We will be taking into account all of the variables listed here on this slide in order to update our revenue and expenditure estimates with the most recent information available. And I will now turn this over for board discussion. Thank you. Okay, board members, any comments or questions on this presentation? Can okay. I just briefly? Um, uh, so we originally were going to cut out, um, uh, I, sorry, the number is escaping me, certain millions of dollars. And then we said, oh my gosh, the governor is going to take away so much that we need to make, I think it was 18.4 million in cuts. Where have we landed with this new revision, um, in terms of how much overall we're, we're scaling back or has, has this not, I, I don't know how to articulate this the right way. How is this? Yeah, but if you could please Michelle, go back to that last slide. No, not that one though. A slide that shows what our adopted budget was. 
right there. So if you noticed when we adopted our budget based on the May revision, it was 182 million. And so what we will be bringing back to you within the next, at the next board meeting is a draft budget with a new projected LCFF total revenue at 197. So the amount that we were gonna cut, which I think was about 18 million, mm -hmm. um, we're only having to cut about three. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? on this item. Okay. We will move to adjournment and we will be adjourning in the memory of Eric Hannah Adrian, daughter of Jeff Adrian, behavior analyst, Cliff Carter, best friend of Ken Whitmore, assistant superintendent of human resources, Barbara Mat Matias, mother-in-law of Marie Matias, credential analyst. Roberta, Roberta Turney Wilsey, retired teacher. And Nancy Hassel, mother of Karen Anderson. Karen is the wife of Howard Kornblum, director of English Learners and Instructional Support. May I have a motion to adjourn? Move, so move, David Olson. Okay. Second. Okay. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, meeting adjourned.